scripture, or I'm sorry, the, uh, we need to pray for Dry Branch Church this week. And the word of the day is fasting is the first principle of medicine. Fast and see the strength of the spirit reveal itself. Fasting always changes me, even when what I fast for doesn't change. Anil Lynn Kondi. Mouth that right or not. But uh, trustees will be having a meeting today. I guess you had your meeting at 5 o'clock. Also, in the back, there's going to be a paper being posted by Brother Lynn that everyone would like to put your name and birthday. And, and uh, I guess Brother Lynn needs it for, for something. But uh, he's going to be putting a paper back there. And, and you can leave, leave that. I think you're buffing on me already, brother. <laughs> yeah, don't have to put it here. <laughs> I'm starting to hear comments from up here. <laughs> it's not for the purpose of doing your age. <laughs> Give me that evil eye. <laughs> See, the pastors and deacons and wives are going to Claudia Sanders' restaurant on Saturday, March 19th at 4 p.m. So I guess we'll meet here at the church, what, about a quarter, a quarter to four? Or something, or something like that for, for travel. Uh, open prayer time is Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. Sorry, I missed Operation Christmas uh, Child Shoebox Ministry. is collecting stuffed animals in February. So tomorrow will be the last day, I guess, uh, to collect the stuffed animals for February. And then back to the open prayer time Tuesday morning, I really suggest that, that if anybody has the time and availability, I mean, to come here at 9 o'clock and have open prayer time with Brother Lynn. Uh, it's a good moment of fellowship. Not only that, you can sit down and put your petitions to the Lord. And thank you for continued support on our ongoing ministries, Operation Christmas Child Shoe Box Ministry and Bags of Hope Food Pantry. Other opportunities be Sunday school at 945. And again, I've said it before, I highly recommend you come to those. You don't know what you're missing. Uh, we really have a good moment of fellowship teaching in Sunday school. And we study the Word of God and get into a deep study of the Word. So uh, I really recommend you come to that. You won't be disappointed. Wednesday Bible study and prayer. I recommend you come to that also because we uh, really have a good prayer time and to study the Word of God. Really uh, beneficial to us from Brother Lynn's teachings. And on Wednesday also we have the children and youth uh, church. So, and I've said it every day since I've been coming up here this month. If you know any children, please get them to church. Whether it be relative, neighbor, or anyone you know, try to get them in church so that they can get good morals and values uh, set into their heart where they can let the Lord take over their life and keep guide them in, in to their adulthood. If we don't, the world's going to get them. Amen. And the church and the child will be done. Uh, unless the Holy Spirit intervenes. But uh, pray for the young ones in our nation. Amen. And the uh, scripture verse of the week, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are, upon, are open until their cry. The righteous cry, and the Lord hear it, and deliver them out of all their troubles. Psalms 34, verses 15 and 17. Let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this blessed day, this beautiful day that you have given. Father, we thank you for your Son, our Lord Christ Jesus, for the love that was poured out, an agape love, mm -hmm. that, that is so great and wonderful. And Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit, the Comforter that you send to us to guide us and teach us in our daily lives. Convict us when we step out of line. Father, I thank you for this 
beautiful church, this beautiful congregation. And we thank you for these beautiful children. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for our pastor and for the anointing that you have placed upon him with the truth that has been spoken. Father, we pray for those that are sick and not able to attend for their healing and comfort. And we pray for those that, that have lost loved ones for their healing and comfort. Father, we thank you for the praise reports that we hear every day. Mm. And Father, we thank you for the love that you pour out in opening our eyes mm. and, letting us, and revealing to us the truth. Father, I pray that each, indi indi each individual here tonight, <coughs> let the teachings and the truth that's spoken pierce their hearts and their minds. And that we reflect on you daily and to seek your face daily. Father, I praise you and give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise. And that your will be done. In Christ Jesus' name.
Hey, man. Hey, man, that's a good thing. Mm. <coughs> if a couple of our ushers come forward. Turn with me to the book of Acts tonight. The book of Acts. Chapter 17. Just want to read a couple of verses together. Good to see you out tonight. Acts chapter 17, beginning with verse 30. Acts 17, beginning with verse 30, thus saith the Lord. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, for of he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Let's pray, please. Uh, 
our heavenly father we bow our hearts once again before you we come thanking you once again for the privilege and the opportunity to come into your midst we do welcome you sweet sweet holy spirit of god father i pray that you take and use me as your vessel tonight by cleansing me throughout by the power of the blood of jesus christ i pray you'd open our hearts and minds to be receptive to the breaking of the bread and father to the video that we'll be watching that lord our eyes might be open to know the enemy that's within that lord has all intentions of destroying and hindering your work but we know that lord in your strength we can continue on with your work and so father we ask tonight that you be with us as a church family we ask you to continue to guide our paths, Lord, and keep us on the path that only you would direct us on. Father, we do pray again for all those that are sick tonight. Lord, we have many that are sick. Father, I do pray for those in Ukraine tonight. God, I pray for those precious, precious souls. God, I pray you watch care over them. I pray, God, that your will be done. Lord, I thank you tonight for the privilege of standing here breaking the bread of life and ask that you minister to our hearts now. Help us to be open-minded, Lord, to the things that are going on around us, Lord, as we talked about this morning, the need to pray and fast because there is so much satanic influence within our lives and all around us in society today, Lord. Father, help us to realize all the more in these times the need that we have for you, Lord, for your guidance and direction, for your watch care of us. Father, I pray tonight if there's anybody here that's never surrendered or trusted you with all of their heart by confessing their sins and trusting in the blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin, I pray that tonight might be that night for them, Lord. Father, we just commend all things into your hands and ask that your will be done. We'll certainly give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. For all of God's people said, Amen. 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 In reading this passage, does this mean a time when God looked away from sin? <clears throat> and the answer to that is certainly no. God has never looked away from what sin is and the way that it separates us. And as we've been going through these last four weeks, on Sunday evening to learn more about things that are going on within. It's basically called the enemies within the church. Uh, I do pray that some have been enlightened. For those of you that have been here, I think our eyes have been open to some things that are going on. And prayerfully tonight, our eyes will continue to be opened. Uh, the last two or three minutes of this uh, video is, uh, is very, very powerful. Trust me, when you get to the end of this video, you'll see what I'm talking about. But Paul uh, is speaking here in this passage about the patience of, of God and the grace of God. Uh, not that God lessens the seriousness of sin, but men think of God's grace sometimes <coughs> to approve certain sin. Uh, sometimes, as we talked last week about it, people change their views. They change their outlook on, on things. And we have found that the enemy within, that being some of the people that's within the depths and some of our leaders within that which we believe have changed their, their reasoning. And so it's uh, important for us to realize that because if we don't realize that by studying the word of God, then somebody can get up and teach that very thing which they changed doctrine to be to have you and I to believe that if we don't know the difference in that. And so the Bible does condemn uh, sin. And the Bible says here that all sin is going to be judged by the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul says Jesus came into the world and that God asked everyone to turn to the Lord. Turning to Jesus creates a responsibility for us. Uh, I, I think it's our duty. I think it's our responsibility to study the, the word of God, to, to know the doctrines, that which we believe about what God's word says, 
in order to know how to differ from that which is taught or which is shown to be otherwise or in opposition to God himself. So the problem is that there are people in the Southern Baptist Convention that are not honoring their responsibilities. Uh, the problem is, even within the church today, a lot of people aren't honoring their responsibilities, fulfilling their duties, uh, you might say, uh, to learn uh, this way in which God wants us to live and direct the problem here. Some need to repent and, and certainly want. Uh, some know and just condone it. They won't do anything about it. We see that we have found that within this video. There are certain people within our convention that, as I said last week, you know, sometimes people can change their views on something and as long as it's not something that's uh, in total opposition to the Word of God, uh, I, I can see it a little differently and I can accept that fact. But when things are just so dogmatic and total opposition to the way of God's teaching us to live our life and the responsibility we have to live by that responsibility, then we, we, we can't commend it, we can't go along with it. And we need to know about it. And so it's basically just uh, an eye-opener for us to be aware of what's going on and to make sure that we're under sound doctrine, under the teaching of God's Word by the Spirit of the Holy, uh, by the truth of the Holy Spirit. And so the Bible says that when the Lord judges, He's going to do it the right way. God assures all men that there's going to be a judgment. And so just a question before Jim shows us the video here is, who are we going to be obedient to? I do think and pray uh, that you, like myself tonight, uh, are looking at this thing and saying, I'm going to be obedient to the Lord. I'm going to follow the ways of God. And so, Brother Jim, if you'll uh, share that with Brother Kenny, would you flip those lights up, please? <clears throat> church planning, the budget has expanded from $23 million in 2010 to $75 million. Actual expenditures have grown over $50 million. Church plant numbers have gone down, down, down. We're far below in 2019 where we were in 2014, for example. So then the question is, how are those $69 to $75 million being spent each year? Uh, we don't know. Uh, how many churches are being funded? We don't know. And then how many are funded state by state? We don't know. It is abundantly clear that they actually believe themselves to be superior to the rest of us. Don't think so? Disagree with their legal abuses out loud. Three people spoke out against Matt Hall. He thinks connecting the dots of race, and by race he means critical race theory and social justice with the gospel. That's what he saw was his great calling. One guy was asked to leave that year. The other two that spoke out were fired just a couple of weeks ago. What uh, about you? Yeah, that, I was one of those two guys. You were fired? I was fired. Now, After every, how many years? 22. The men who were willing to speak out in That's favor right. of real biblical orthodoxy. Yes. You got marked. Yes. And as soon as there was an excuse, you're the first to get fired. Uh, yeah. There's the old statement, never let a crisis go to waste. And that's exactly what uh, happened here. I submitted a resolution the Southern Baptist Convention and said that there were four things that we should denounce. We should denounce non-disclosure agreements. We should denounce gentlemen's agreements. We should denounce what people call the 11th commandment, which is just the supposed biblical instruction never to criticize other Baptist leaders. And we should renounce retaliation. So I submit that resolution. And then Randy Stinson told me at one point, did you do this because we used the NDAs with all of the firing? And you didn't even know? I didn't even know. I said, I did that because of Harvey Weinstein, but now you're telling me that you are using non-disclosure agreements? Because- <laughs> No wonder they're so sensitive. <laughs> there is no biblical basis for a non-disclosure agreement. The Southern Baptist Convention was being run by people who did not want sunlight on any of their problems. On top of it all, they fired me and then I had secret recordings 
because I could see how they kept on changing everything and they wouldn't put anything in writing. And I knew that these people were playing dirty. So I had recordings, I had saved my document. I released those to the public so people would know what was going on. And they released a statement claiming that I had made that up, that nobody had ever told me to avoid discussing homosexuality. They put that on the Southwestern Seminary website and they pushed that out on Twitter. They didn't know that I had the recordings. You're saying that if, if we do end up saying to you, you cannot run that article or that is not gonna help this institution, mm -hmm. you're saying you're gonna do it anyway. I'm going to be obedient to God. And if I'm called to do something that you are trying to block, I will do what God called me to do. Okay. I will be obedient to God. The fact that they were going to go to such an extent of having engaged in the non-disclosure agreements, having distorted the curriculum, having tried to force me to give up my testimony and to basically participate in this falsehood about same-sex attracted Christianity, they were then willing to try to destroy my family, to drive me out of my profession, to ruin my reputation so I couldn't support my children and my wife. And they were going to do all that while claiming to be Christian. There is nothing Christian about this at all. There are methods of intimidation that are used by social justice ideologues masquerading as professors at universities like Indiana Wesleyan and seminaries. And these tactics are social in nature and they have to do with stripping people of prestige, stripping people of credibility, uh, stripping people of their, their friendships really, if they don't comply with what social justice ideology, with what the woke cult teaches them to comply with. I was uh, forced into a meeting with the entire staff of the John Wesley Honors College. And so I was at one end of a conference table and the entire faculty were lined at the other ends of the table. And uh, essentially they, they attempted to uh, put me under trial really. Um, it was a kangaroo court in which they told me that because I was rebelling against the social justice narrative, uh, I needed to repent of, uh, of essentially my conservative biblical beliefs. And uh, I didn't agree to doing that. And eventually I was kicked out of the Honors College program at Indiana Wesleyan University. They don't want people who are going to push back against the woke narrative in their universities successfully. And so the, the method and, and the modus operandi of these people is to kick them out as soon as it's evident that they're not gonna change their mind. Trevor, when you look at the evidence concerning the Southern Baptist Convention, what are your thoughts? If you look at it from a left-wing point of view, the Southern Baptists were one of the last bastions of true Christianity in America and very socially and politically conservative. Right. So if you could conquer the Southern Baptists and move them to the left, you could move the whole politics of the South and, and, and America to the left. It would be a major conquest. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it in a purely secular way, this was a battle fought by the left to conquer and take over the Southern Baptists like they've taken over universities, like they've taken over Hollywood. It was just another institution on their list. Mm -hmm. Well, I start finding out that Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary is not the only compromise institution within evangelical Christianity. In fact, most of evangelical Christianity is compromised on some level or is in the process of being compromised. So one of the first things that happened after finding out the extent of to which the cancer had been developing in the Southern Baptist Convention, I was reached out to by people at Crew, formerly Campus Crusade, and they were telling me about what was happening in their organization. And I decided to start watching their staff conference from the summer 2019. And it was worse than anything I think I had seen at Southeastern. It was a woke fest. Your value is determined based on a lie. Your value is determined on your proximity to whiteness and your proximity to black. Friends, it is important for us to be awakened to the racial inequity. You may not be racist or whatever, but we all still live in a racialized society. One who's actually on staff with Crew had everyone in the audience stand up and they read a liturgy 
against white privilege, confessing their sin. We have formed and developed church structures and denominations while excluding the voice of your global church due to racism and racial segregation. Lord, have mercy. We acknowledge the racial hierarchies and structures of privilege many have benefited from, many have been oppressed by. Lord, have mercy. The crew has been a wonderful organization for years. That's right. This, it used to be called Campus Crusade for Christ, right? Well, it did, and they changed that name, and it seems like along with the name change, some other things changed as well. One of the things that I found out was I looked at the Lenses Institute. The Lenses Institute, kind of as the name implies, uh, is for getting those who work with crew to understand culture in a way that makes them less offensive, more winsome, and in order to do that, they must look at the culture through a new lens. So it's intersectionality, which is social yeah. justice. It's not the lens of scripture that they're studying. It's the lens of the oppressed. John Perkins what was popular in the late 60s, mostly early 70s, and did some good things, but he is now thought well of in the Gospel Coalition. He's spoken at Southern Seminary, and he has influenced Cruz Lenses Institute. So I have a couple terms for us to look at today that will be helpful for the activities that we're in, gonna engage in. Keep going, so we're gonna hit stereotypes, prejudice, privilege, and power today. And so when we talk about privilege, it's in all these different aspects of our lives, but, uh, but certainly at skin color as well, and so we'll talk a little bit about that. At the Crew 19 conference, uh, one of the keynote speakers was an individual named Sandra Maria Van Opstel, and she spoke on that she never understood the Book of Amos, even though she had a seminary degree, even though she um, learned Hebrew and she studied it with people who knew what the language said. It wasn't until she studied it with prisoners that she knew what it really meant. And she encouraged the people there at Crew to learn the Bible from the standpoint of the oppressed, to see it through the lens of people who are oppressed by the system, because they somehow have more knowledge. I've been looking at the conferences too, like in 2015, the guest speaker was Michelle Higgins. And she talked about the, the importance, really that the 11th commandment was ending white privilege. This was the whole focus of her talk. You know, this was in the Midwest, the young kids were mainly white because it was the Midwest. And they would have walked out of that conference thinking that God's mission for them was ending white privilege. They might be on food stamps. They might have no money to their name, but their, their big mission was ending white privilege. But what they weren't told is that Michelle Higgins, a pastor from St. Louis, Missouri, is a member of the Organization for Black Struggle, which is a front for a pro-Chinese Communist Party called the Freedom Road Socialist Organization. These are the people that burnt Ferguson, Missouri to the ground. And these are taking their instructions from Communist China. Yet these young evangelical kids are, are being taught this as though it's Christianity. In, in crew documents, they quote actual Maoists. So this is, this is real communism they're being taught. These young, young Christian kids are being taught stuff that basically is in favor of the Beijing's program for the destruction of America. And they think somehow it's biblical. We're seeing that the social justice religion and Christianity are merging and in crew uh, that those waters have met and many staff have reached out to me and told me exactly what's going on in fact this within the last few weeks I've had staff reach out and say that they've been forced out that they've had to quit because of things that they've been asked to do for instance um, some have been required some staff to go to the lenses Institute where they are thoroughly indoctrinated into social justice thinking uh, and, uh, and it's, it's been a, a compromise that they just cannot in good conscience participate in it's easy to think of these things we've been learning about as silos. Just unconnected, isolated individuals and ministries who have made compromising choices. The shocking aspect is that this trail is actually an interconnected web. So you have this main organization called the Gospel Coalition, which was founded by Tim Keller. The Gospel Coalition, which was supposed to be known for being, you know, reformed and, and solid theological teaching, is now writing articles with people from Sojourners, which are Marxists. 
okay? You have them flooding their organization. You have Michael Ware Obama's operative writing for the Gospel Coalition. Then you have Gospel Coalition people going into Oikonomia Network. You have a lot of Oikonomia people involved with the Gospel Coalition. You have uh, Gospel Coalition people, uh, in a lot of them because the Southern Baptists involved with the ERLC. So you have their activists involved with the, ER, the Southern Baptist ERLC. You have Michael Ware also involved writing articles for the ERLC. You have the National Association for Evangelicals. You have Trinity Forum. Every one of them connected. Leftists, leftists, leftists everywhere in all these organizations. One thing these organizations all have in common is they all happen to share the same or similar board members. Then magically, when one of them gets too much heat, they get moved to another organization within the same network. Perhaps we should call it the Socialist Shuffle. Where is this money coming from? Many of these are tied together with funding from the Kern Family Foundation, They've had about 10 years of sending millions and millions and millions of dollars to well over 40 seminaries. Tying many of these groups and individuals together is the Oikonomia Network, whose slogan is Theology That Works. Kern funded the Oikonomia Network, which created all the educational materials that go into these seminaries. Every seminary that took the Kern money has gone well. And what do I mean by woke? They have started on the process of deconstructing traditional Christianity and faith and blending it with postmodern Marxist ideas. It is a propaganda arm. We ran across this group called Dosa. This group brags that one million Christians every week hear their sermons. And we find out that if a pastor uh, isn't feeling up to researching or wants someone to write sermons for him on a certain topic, you pay them and they'll do it. We found that the former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, J.D. Greer, and then the new president of the Southern Baptist Convention preaching on the same series, but it wasn't just preaching on the same series or the same Bible or the same outline, it was verbatim. One of the worst Southern phrases is, bless his heart. Some of Jesus' strongest words in the Gospels were about people like this. In fact, he called them whitewashed tombs. They are there to promote the good. But the point is, this was no Abraham Lincoln. There are two primary things that I believe you and I are gleaned from this passage. I want to talk about two things this morning. I want to talk about the, the responsibilities of those who govern. govern. The second thing you'll see, and this is the most important part, the responsibility of those who You have to ask govern. yourself, is my pastor getting guidance from the Holy Spirit, going in prayer, reading the word, or is he pushing a Marxist agenda in the form of a script that Dosen Group is writing? We'll find that J.D. Greer is endorsing Dosen as a source to help them with their sermons. Matt Chandler, woke pastor, endorsing Dosen as a place to get their sermons. And we find other woke pastors endorsing Dosen Group as a place to get their sermons. Woke, willfully overlooking known evil. So you have woke, but then we have awake, which is always attacking known evil, which is what we're supposed to do as Christians. You want to be woke? Do you want to ignore evil and placate and coddle the sin, or do you want to be awake and attack the devil at his gate? The enemy knows our language. They know our weaknesses, and they know how to exploit it. They know our theology. They know our Christian generosity. They don't care. They will use everything they can to exploit it. When you hear words like white privilege, when you hear words like uh, lenses, when you hear words, you know, we're going to look at oppressor versus oppressed, redistribution, relocation, and we're going to hear learn about social justice. We're going to learn about, and, and you hear all these buzzwords. These are all talking points taken directly out of communist literature and communist ideas. Maybe they look at it like spokes in a wheel. You know, each faith comes from a different point of origin, but they all end up converging like in the hub of the wheel. What do you suppose the fly in the ointment is? The evangelical, not the fly in the ointment. Yeah, these alliances that we're seeing emerge are global in nature. We'll specifically mention the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, the OIC, 
the largest non governmental organization in the world other than the u n itself fifty seven countries aligned together that's one arena that we can look at and then you have even closer there's several names for it there's chris long chris long yes there's interfaith dialogue there is the common word the whole phrase the common word derives right out of a verse in the quran chapter 3 verse 64 come now let us find a common word between you and us that we all worship allah that he has no partners and he that turns aside is not a good muslim that's the rest of the verse so an entire the whole christian world rick warren and jim wallace and all the rest of them base this new coalition this new alliance on a verse from the quran that specifically says that this commonality we have is that we all acknowledge allah so after researching the world council of churches i found two eerie similarities with all the denominations that are part of the world council of churches one they've all denied biblical inerrancy two they all shifted left and they belong to an organization that was controlled by communists. KGB agents actually controlled the World Council of Churches. Denominations like the Southern Baptists, the Wesleyans, and others are all taking the same drift that these past denominations have already done, but they never ask the political question. What is motivating them to go this way? Why are they joining organizations like the Evangelical Immigration Table funded by Soros? This is happening in denominations all over the U.S. They've all implemented <coughs> the same talking points, the same training materials. They might swap it out with a few different names, but it's the same propaganda. It's not biblical, it's Marxism, and they're doing it to deconstruct the church of the United States. Why are they trying to deconstruct the church in the United States? If they take the church, they take the nation. Communist Party USA and Democratic Socialists of America have hundreds of pastors on their rolls hundreds of people in theological colleges and Bible colleges, etc. And they're still indoctrinating people into Marxism. I want to share um, some examples of three different types of sermons I've given that kind of help gently introduce socialist or leftist ideas without being really heavy handed about it. Um, and the reason why I try to navigate this balance is because my church is about 500 people, um, multiracial, middle upper class, um, and, I, you know, I would say it's generally progressive and liberal, but generally not left-left. Um, and there's sort of more radical ideas associated with leftist politics, whether it's abolition, even decriminalization of sex work, uh, socialism, just to name a few, are not so much in our mainstream discourse. And, you know, our philosophy is very much about how do we bring people along instead of just being like, this is who we are, get with it or not. As a church and that's that was our approach towards becoming lgbt affirming and so i try to take a similar approach when it comes to talking about leftist ideas uh, through sermons communism is just a scientific manifestation of evil and it will keep coming back and keep coming back and we'll have to fight it till the end of time why are kind of enemies to our nation <coughs> defending their own society while promoting everything that destroys us from the inside here in america why is china going after effeminate men while our churches are encouraging effeminate men? Why is Russia cracking down on homosexuality and our churches are promoting it? God is gay! God is gay! There's a problem. We at Pacific Justice Institute have put a lot of time and a lot of work into putting together model bylaws and policies for Christian institutions, parachurch ministries, colleges to adopt that makes it very easy for them to protect themselves. Imagine if everyone in one of these organizations, let's say crew, for instance, imagine if everyone in crew who was against the direction of crew all at once stood up and said, we're not gonna take this anymore. We'll start our own organization if we have to. Our donors aren't gonna take this anymore. Imagine what would happen. Instead of having everyone cower and, and just submit to the authoritarian rule that's coming. So we have to resist it and we have to do it in a positive way. If we don't see that kind of revival, we are doomed. We are, we are destined to break down either into some form of Western European slash Chinese neo-Marxism where it won't be a totalitarian <clears throat> regime because you can't
can't keep us down. That's what the Chinese figured out after Tiananmen Square, is if we just gave people phones and uh, big screen TVs, they'll be far more compliant. And so we'll have some form of that here. Religious liberty will go the way of the dodo bird, like what you've seen in Western Europe. What I would tell parents and donors is to stop sending your kids and to stop sending money to these institutions until they turn around and they begin to preach the truth and they apologize for the lie that they have told. Because until that happens, you're just going to get the same result, especially parents. You are going to watch your children over the course of four years grow from people who have been trained in righteousness, trained in the truth of Christianity, the truth of the gospel, into people who are now trained Marxists, mm. trained woke cultists, people who are devoted to social justice ideology, your children will be unrecognizable if you continue to send them to these institutions. You cannot trust these institutions with your money, you can't trust them with your children, you can't trust them with your time because they will waste all of them. And in some cases, they may be the catalyst for your child rejecting the faith. We've got lots of people now that don't think they were born with any gender. We've got clergy holding public prayer blessings at abortion clinics. We have homosexual men and women wearing clergy collars and preaching in the pulpits and calling themselves pastors and bishops. We have men pretending that they're women, insisting upon invading women's restrooms. Women pretend that they're men and insist upon invading men's restrooms. The local church can't string a sentence together without mentioning love all the time. This is the result of telling people God loves you instead of telling them they need to repent. If we would just do what the Bible tells us to do, we would just say what it says to say. That message is so powerful. There's not an army in the world that can withstand it. Amen. There's not a nation in the world that can withstand the preaching of the real gospel. There's not a false religion on this planet that can survive a people willing to preach the real gospel. This gospel overthrows wicked kingdoms and takes down tyrants and brings liberty out of the ground. This gospel puts joy inside of people that cannot be smashed, no matter how evil it gets in society. You can't stop the real gospel of God. Amen. The problem is not that people don't want the gospel. The problem in America is not that the gospel's too weak and the devil's too big. The problem is Amen. You substituted it with sugar. If we would preach the gospel, we could still save this country. The gospel is the only way to save America. Obey the gospel. Amen. And what is the gospel? It's a kingdom with laws. How do you save America? I'll tell you how. You have to preach the real gospel and you have to confront people and be willing to have them say, you're mean, I don't like you. You have to be willing to lose your job to stand for something. You have to be willing to not get invited to some party. You have to be willing to be uninvited from the next family reunion. When Jesus said, if you're not willing to turn your back on your brothers and sisters and mother and father, you can't be my disciple. He was serious. Amen. I'm tired of fake Christianity. Amen. It's hard enough to do my job. I need real warriors. Preachers who are listening and watching, you've got to preach the real gospel and stop patting people on the head. You've got to do what Jesus said to do, and you start the gospel with repent. The kingdom, the laws, you broke them. Mm. You cannot skip that step. If you skip that step, you're cheating people out of salvation. It begins in the pulpit, but it immediately leans upon you sitting in the pews. Mm. You are the ones that are called to herald the gospel to your friends, your family, and your neighbors. You're the ones, not just us. It's you too. You have to tell people, listen, 
there's a kingdom. There's a, it has laws. You can see it in the Ten Commandments. It's the simplest way to look at it. This is simple. You've broken them. You're in trouble. You've got to repent. Jesus made a way for you to get saved from what you're going to get if you don't repent, and that's hell. What am I supposed to repent for? Just because you say it's sin? I don't think it's a sin. No, you got to repent for your sins. Well, how does anybody know that they've sinned? Who gets to define what sin is? Us? No, God does. You have to take them to what the Apostle Paul said is the schoolmaster that leads them to Christ. What is the schoolmaster according to the Apostle Paul? In Galatians 3.24, he says that the Old Testament law, the law of the kingdom, this is the schoolmaster that will get you to Jesus Christ. What do you need the law for to get to Jesus Christ? I thought Jesus did away with the law. You thought wrong. Jesus did away with the law of sin and death. He didn't do away with the good ideas of not lying, stealing, and cheating, and killing each other. You've been taught by antinomian heretics. You don't even know what that verse means. The founding fathers lived in an era when the church valued the law of God. They loved it. They loved the Ten Commandments in the churches. The pastors cared. That was the era. In 1789, when the Constitution was ratified, they codified the Ten Commandments into state law in every state. That's the difference. And why did they do that? Because they were preaching the real gospel in those days. They had George Whitfield. They had people that knew what the gospel was. They weren't running around saying, God loves you, have a flower. So we find the Apostle Paul, Acts chapter 17, verse 30. Listen to the Apostle Paul preach the same thing. I'm supposed to be preaching, and you're supposed to be sharing with your friends that need Jesus. This is his words, Acts 17, verse 30. God is now proclaiming to mankind all people everywhere are to repent. Because he set a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all people by raising him from the dead. That's Acts 17, 30 and 31, and that's the Apostle Paul preaching the real gospel, the one of repentance. When you preach the real gospel, you'll get real gospel results. When you preach a counterfeit gospel, you will get counterfeit gospel results. Do you know what would happen in America if every pastor next Sunday began to preach the real gospel that I just explained to you? I'm going to tell you exactly what would happen. I want you to listen carefully. They would have half their church leave. And it would be the best thing that ever happened to the American church. Flush out the fakes. Flush out the flesh. Flush out the pansies. Flush out the people who want... All the Jesus without any of the work. And that's why they won't do it. And they know what I know. You get up and you give somebody a puzzle piece, they get mad and they'll never come back. The best thing that would happen in America is if American pastors would get up and stop playing games with people. Tell them there's a kingdom and it's got laws and you're breaking them and we don't tolerate that around here. You'll run them out of the building. And then you know what happened two weeks later? God would come back to church. The presence of God would come back in the room because all of the people that are an offense to him that walk around in their lukewarm sin would be out of there not contaminating his house. Let's put the right box top in front of us and start reassembling the shattered pieces of our civilization and our church. And let's pray that God will raise up pastors who are willing to run some people out of their congregations so we can start fresh. Maybe we can turn this around. I had a few things I was going to talk about. Uh, I don't think anything else needs to be said. Uh, I hope this was as, as enlightening to you as it is to me. But it's the truth. We've got so many people running around that's not serious enough about what sin is and so many people that really, truly just need to repent. 
to make Jesus Lord of their life and follow the Lord. It's a time for us to be serious about the business of God's kingdom. I don't know what God said to you tonight. Let's just stand. And, if you would stand and bow your heads and close your eyes. And just allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart tonight. we ask ourselves how serious are we about the kingdom work how passionate are we about the true gospel as he shared with us tonight my friends listen if there is one thing I would like to comment on is this our young people are in deep trouble in our colleges, in our universities, even our elementary and high schools. Our children are in trouble, my friends, because of the indoctrination over the last many years in which they have been taught and are being taught today this wokeism. Just maybe God's going to show us a way that we might be able to do something about that. Let us be open-minded about what God might lead us to do as a congregation. Brother Ryan, you're going to come and lead us in a hymn of invitation, brother. I have decided to follow Jesus. Page 305. service, brother.